Well, it, it is my honor to introduce uh, to you John uh, Turbor. And I have to say that tradition dictates that I introduce him by reviewing the shelf of books he's written and the stack of uh, seminal papers. But I'm tempted to toss aside uh, that tradition and instead address the question that I know is on many of your minds, which is, uh, what in heaven's name is the law school doing hosting a tropical ecologist? And uh, what business does a law professor have uh, nominating a scientist for the Brannigan Lecture? So let me just take a couple of minutes to explain to you uh, why, to explain to you the answers to those questions before I let John Turborg uh, present his lecture and his uh, quite stunning slideshow. And I guess the, the answer to those questions has to do with that part of Professor Turborg's resume that isn't so obvious from his list, his amazingly impressive list of scientific accomplishments. Uh, John Turborg is public intellectual. And uh, I would say for anybody who is planning to be an advocate or wield power in the realm of public policy, and as you know, there are many people in the hallways of this building who are planning to do just that. His public essays, not the least of which, uh, say, the collection of works he's written for the New York Review of Books, constitutes an exceedingly important primer on uh, understanding how the world works. And by the world, I mean not just the ecological world that he studies, but also the social, the economic, the political world, all of which is within his ken as a public intellectual. And I don't know anybody who is uh, more clear in his explanations and uh, more clear-sighted in his prescriptions with respect to conservation than John Turfor. In addition to his public writings, his books, the New York Review of Books reviews, he's also played a really important role in uh, launching the field of conservation biology, which, as most people in this room know, concerns itself not just with understanding nature, but also exploring ways to sustain the benefits of nature for humanity. And it's particularly appropriate this semester which is our sustainability semester on campus this year that we are able to host John Turbor. Now, I've warned John that many of uh, the students and some of the professors <coughs> in this room have uh, classes they need to go to toward the end of the hour. So he understands some of you may have to get up toward the end of the lecture. In order to minimize that disruption, I'll terminate my introduction at this point so that we can get on with the main feature <coughs> presentation. Please join me in welcoming the campus, John Turbo. Well, thank you very much for that generous introduction. It's uh, my first time to this campus, and I'm uh, having a lot of fun meeting people and, and engaging in, uh, in stimulating conversations. This is a rather uh, unsettling title, I'm sure, because uh, conservation has been uh, an ongoing uh, concern and activity in, in this country and many other countries for a long, long time. And uh, now at uh, this late date in the uh, uh, history of conservation, uh, we come to the conclusion that we need to rethink a lot of the things we've been doing. And, uh, um, so uh, there's, a, there's a short answer to this question, a long answer, and I'll start with a short answer and then spend most of the rest of the hour talking about the long answer. And short answer as to why we need a new conservation concept is uh, that conservation started a long time ago, um, more than 100 years ago, and uh, long, long before there was anything called conservation science. Conservation science has come along much more recently. In fact, its origins can be traced to a, a seminal conference that was held in, in September of 1978 in San Diego, California. That is when conservation biology was, was inaugurated as a, a distinct uh, stand, a stand on its own platform um, discipline. And so what we've learned about how to conserve um, species has only mostly come subsequent to, to 1978. And as, as we all know, and as I'll be saying, uh, much of our conservation 
uh, in practice was done in the first half of the 20th century, a good 50 years before there was anything that you could call conservation science. So um, uh, that's, that's the short answer. Now let's uh, uh, proceed to the long answer. Um, Conservation started uh, in 1872 with the establishment of Yellowstone, and only a few years later, uh, the, uh, the Canadians followed suit by uh, protecting a complex of, uh, of parks in the Canadian Rockies, which you see here. And I really would like the lights down a little lower than this, if we can manage that. Um, the, the, uh, this early phase of, of conservation had nothing whatsoever to do with, with organisms or, or uh, even biology. The uh, uh, term biodiversity had not been created. The, the continent was still being explored, and uh, so uh, the biology didn't seem to be an issue then. But uh, bringing tourists uh, and generating uh, uh, funds for railroads and hotels uh, was, was as then as now still a major priority. And that was the, uh, the impetus to create parks. And the parks were created around the spectacular landscapes like this one, uh, resulting in a, in a phase of, of conservation action that uh, we, we can now refer to as monumentalism. And uh, I, I don't want to diminish the value of any of these parks. They're magnificent. They're, they're the gems of our, uh, of our uh, collective accomplishment in conservation. Uh, but uh, they are lacking in some important details. And uh, if, if you can see, this slide is a little dark. But if you can see there, um, the forest is very uniform. And in fact, nearly every tree that you can see in that picture is the same species. There is no diversity there. When everything is the same, diversity is zero. Uh, well, it's not quite zero, but it's pretty close to zero. Um, and so if you're concerned about biodiversity uh, and the exuberance of life, this is probably not where you're going to find it. Uh, instead, you're going to find it in places like this. Um, uh, this looks out over the canopy of a of a forest in, in northern Mato Grosso in Brazil. And uh, if you look here, uh, you can see there's one tree, this tree. It's a Tababuya chrysantha. It's uh, in full flower, uh, which is appropriate for the dry season. That's when they flower. Uh, but if you look around this scene, there's probably a thousand or more tree crowns visible. And yet there's only one that is blooming bright yellow. That, my friends, is diversity. When diversity is really high, there's only one of everything. Everything is different, and there's only one of each of them. And so this scene with thousands of trees in it, there's only one Tababuya chrysantha. And in fact, in that whole scene, there are probably more than a thousand different species of trees. So this is the absolute antithesis of the last picture, which had one species of tree multiplied over and over and over again in complete monotony. This is, this is diversity. And the question I'm going to address today is, what is it that it's going to take to conserve this diversity? And uh, that, is a, that is a scientifically very, very deep question. And uh, the answer has been elusive, but I think it's finally uh, becoming clear now. Well. Uh, Conservation directed towards biodiversity, towards, whoops, whoops, uh, I'm sorry. OK, I should push the button by accident, excuse me. It uh, uh, didn't start really until after World War II, when uh, in, the, uh, in Europe, the, the world wildlife was, uh, was established. And in uh, North America here, it was the uh, Nature Conservancy, which uh, started out with some quite quite different goals as an offshoot of the uh, Ecological Society of America, the scientists that, that created it. And so naturally, the Nature Conservancy understood right from the word go that, that science was a, a core um, a need in, in conservation planning and design. The trouble is there wasn't any science at the time. They hired an excellent scientist, Robert Jenkins, to de design their programs, uh, but he had to really uh, invent them from scratch because uh, the, 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 the intellectual foundations that would uh, uh, give rise to a, a, a sort of a natural 
a program simply, uh, simply didn't then exist. And so uh, being a small organization, at least at the start, they're now a billion dollar a year organization, so they've, they've grown enormously. But at the beginning, they had rather meager resources, and, and they did what they could, well, which was to uh, start acquiring very small uh, pieces of land. Uh, but uh, those small beginnings has given rise to a really a very uh, gratifying response, not only within the United States here, but around the world. These are data from the uh, WCMC World uh, Conservation Monitoring Center on the uh, global aggregate of protected areas, uh, which is that, uh, that black line that forms the outer envelope. You see it really uh, is uh, begins to take off in the, in the 60s and 70s, and that's when uh, developing countries uh, began to catch on to this idea that it was, it was good to uh, establish protected areas and conserve something of their, of their natural resources. And uh, it was a very contagious idea, and uh, now uh, we've reached the point that 12% uh, of the Earth's terrestrial realm uh, is in some form or another uh, 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 has protected status. Uh, but the uh, terrestrial data and the uh, marine data you see are by green and blue lines. The, the terrestrial trend, uh, trend is leveling off and that's understandable because the world every year is more crowded than it was the year before. So there's uh, fewer and fewer opportunities to conserve additional land. Nevertheless, there's a meeting going on right now in Japan at which the conservation groups are advocating uh, that uh, the world strive to get to 20% from the 12% where we are. I mean, that's a very ambitious goal. It'd be wonderful one if it were achieved. Some countries are already beyond it, um, which is nice to know. Um, but um, as I say, given the increasing scarcity of land everywhere, um, that's, that is indeed a very ambitious goal. On the other hand, uh, marine conservation is just uh, beginning, and I think there's, there's going to be quite a, a surge of, of creation of new marine protected areas, as it's demonstrated uh, again and again and again that uh, the, the presence of protected areas greatly increases fishing yields outside the protected area because of the, uh, the protected populations that are inside. Um, it's wonderful to know that, uh, that the idea of parks and, and land conservation is, is, has been accepted by nearly every country on, on the earth. There are only two or three, just a tiny little uh, handful of countries that don't already have um, well-established uh, protected area systems. And so this, th there's been almost universal acceptance of the idea, but there has not been universal um, uh, commitment to implementation and funding and protecting the so-called protected areas. An awful lot of them are not protected. They're what we call paper parks. And so for, um, to, to redress this situation, I, I ran an organization for 10 years that we called Parks Watch, and it was dedicated to uh, investigating the, this, the state and condition uh, and circumstances of parks in Latin America. We worked in several countries and we evaluated over 100 uh, parks and other protected areas. And, and these are the kinds of, of scenes that uh, we, we found inside uh, national parks in various Latin American countries. There's poaching, this is a jaguar being skinned in Peru. Um, there's uh, illegal clearing, there's uh, settlements and encroachment, the road building, cattle, raising uh, slash and burn agriculture, illegal logging, mining, everything you can think of is happening in national parks in um, countries around the world because they simply uh, have not invested in the, in the staff and in the enforcement that's necessary to uh, maintain the integrity of parks. So this is a serious problem. I want to draw it to your attention. I'm not going to talk about it any further. I'm going to talk about uh, science. So let's go back to the Nature Conservancy and the kind of concept they started out with in the 50s and 60s. Uh, they uh, bought land and they are still doing it, but with meager resources they could only buy little pieces of land, like this uh, portion of the Green Swamp in North Carolina. Many of the places they, they chose to invest in 
uh, real environmental gems, as, as is this particular example. Um, places where there were rare plants, rare um, uh, biological communities that um, seem to be uh, extremely threatened. Well, uh, the, this is a, a moist um, longleaf pine savanna in, in North Carolina, and it has one of the richest plant communities in the world on the scale of a square meter. There are uh, uh, up to f f over 50 species of vascular plants per square meter in this, uh, in this environment. It's the home of the famous Venus flytrap and a lot of other insectivorous plants. And it's, it's rich with uh, rare plants of many different kinds, like this uh, uh, wonderful Michaud's lily, like Calipogon and the, uh, the orange-fringed orchid, and uh, one of my favorites, these uh, yellow trumpets of the, of the pitcher plants. There are four different pitcher plant species in this, in this community. Um, so this is the kind of approach to conservation that the uh, Nature Conservancy practiced in its early days. Its thinking is now evolving along with the, with the science, but uh, the, the uh, practice was to uh, identify and then to acquire uh, these environmental gems, which are nearly always very small, and therein lies a major problem. Well, in the, uh, things were going fine, everybody was content, and uh, we thought we were doing conservation uh, until uh, some cracks began to appear in this fabric um, in the mid-1970s. Now, I credit the beginning of, 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 this, uh, of this new uh, insight uh, to a group at Rutgers University in New Jersey under Richard Foreman and Charles Leck. They provided the first data. These aren't the first, but they came very shortly afterward. These are data on the bird community of a long-established park, Rock Creek Park in, in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Um, D.C. was set up as a city, as you all should know, in around 1790. Uh, it was designed by the famous uh, French architect uh, Lafayette, and uh, included in it were some uh, very substantial parks, including Rock Creek Park, which uh, follows the creek of its, uh, its, its name uh, from no the northern Maryland suburbs right down into the Potomac River in Georgetown. Um, it's uh, because it was established in 1790, uh, the forest there is now over 200 years old. It's, honest to goodness, old growth. There's no succession going on. Um, and yet, uh, around 1980, uh, it was noticed that something terribly wrong uh, was happening to its uh, bird community. Um, and that was based on the fortuitous circumstance that people have been censusing birds in this park in a systematic and organized way since right after World War II in the 1940s when they established the baseline data, which is in that first column. And you see there were some birds that were really, really, really common, uh, uh, really dominant in the bird community of Rock Creek Park in the 1940s. Overall, about 90 pairs per 100 hectares, um, which is more or less normal, what should be considered normal. But 40 years later, there was a completely different situation. The birds that had been most abundant in 1940 had dropped drastically in their abundance, minus 86, minus 91, minus 99, and these six species listed in red had disappeared altogether from the community. Um, while the total number of breeding individuals fell from 90 to about 40, um, uh, uh, 35 is rather, it's a drop of about 40%. So something um, had uh, impacted the, the bird community, and uh, that presented a huge mystery that then sent off, uh, set off a lot of new research. But uh, the, the, the first uh, wave of interest in this phenomenon, which was discovered to be happening all over the eastern United States, there were data just like this from Michigan, from, uh, from Illinois, from Wisconsin, from Connecticut, from Maryland. Um, and so it wasn't something just unique to Rock Creek Park. It was something that was happening on, on the scale of a continent, or at least half a continent. And uh, nearly always these 
places where there was before data like this, really rare and, and priceless uh, uh, data, which uh, is all in, in the too much in short supply, unfortunately. But wherever there was such before data, um, it, uh, they were small patches of forest. They were often university forests. Um, as in, as in the tree lease woods in Illinois, for example. It's outside the Chabana, uh, Champaign-Urbana campus, and the ornithologists on campus had been censusing, so we had before data. But it was just fortuitous circumstances like that that uh, uh, determined whether there was any data at all. But uh, the, uh, the change in the community was drastic, and the first uh, uh, the conclusion people jumped to was that Oh, it's because of fragmentation. Um, these forests are isolated. Um, they're surrounded by farmlands or by, uh, by uh, the suburban development. And it's the isolation that is uh, th at the root of the problem. So there were lots and lots of studies of, of, uh, based on the uh, model of island biogeography, uh, looking at the, the area of these fragments of, of their isolation from larger patches of habitat of the same kind. And uh, it, it all seemed to point to something, uh, something to do with fragmentation. Well, um, as I say, there was, a, there was a major surge of research, and the fragmentation paradigm was, was uh, prevalent until uh, a paper came out in the uh, British journal Nature, written by a graduate student at the University of Maryland. His name is William Newmark. Uh, Newmark studied the mammals, the larger mammals of major national parks in Western North America. I mean, here you, here's the Canadian Rockies. You saw a picture of that. That's Glacier, Yellowstone, Tetons, Rocky Mountain, Grand Canyon, so forth. These are our, our uh, most important and national parks. Uh, well, Newmark found something that was so shocking to the conservation community that an awful lot of people didn't even want to believe it. And so he was, he was uh, received with, a, with a more than uh, a deserved amount of hostility and challenge to uh, go back to the data and redo a lot of his work. Um, and so some years later, he had to publish a second report on it, which only served to reinforce and substantiate everything he'd shown first time around. So his, his critics were just uh, arguing from disbelief, not from um, uh, solid uh, scientific arguments. Here's what he found in national parks. Uh, whoops, sorry. Um, um, th there are seven of them listed here, from the smallest to the, to the largest. And the age of these parks, uh, they were all founded uh, in the early 20th century or before, um, ranged from about 60 to 90 years. And um, uh, with the exception of the complex in the Canadian Rockies, all of them had lost uh, major mammal species. And uh, the smaller ones had lost lots of mammals, 30, 40 percent. Now, that's really... Um, uh, uh, terribly surprising and discouraging. Um, here is our, our finest efforts at conservation, our national parks, and they're leaking species uh, at a rate that would practically deplete them of any mammal fauna at all uh, in a century or two. Uh, but this, is, uh, this is not a conservation success story. It's quite, quite the opposite. And uh, of course, it, it raised uh, uh, lots of questions about why these animals were disappearing. A lot of people wanted to attribute it to fragmentation, but really that doesn't, that's not an argument that has much bite when you consider that most of these parks are set in landscapes that are, are fundamentally public lands. Uh, the surrounding areas are BLM lands or um, Forest Service lands or both. The Yellowstone, for example, is surrounded by five or six national forests. And uh, uh, the Grand Canyon has national forests, both north and south, etc. Uh, these aren't really fragments, a lot of them, and yet they're still losing species. So this, this was the first evidence to come along, really cast doubt on this idea that, that simply fragmentation was the root of the problem. Nevertheless, uh, the data from these national parks, uh, when plotted against area, the rates of extinction observed against area, 
uh, showed a very strong area effect, which is what you expect in the, in the fragmentation uh, 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 scenario. And uh, uh, the, uh, the Earth trend line goes to the, uh, to the zero extinction baseline at an area of about 10,000 square kilometers. Well, that's a big place. Um, Yellowstone is almost 10,000 square kilometers. The complex of four parks in, in Canada is 20,000. So uh, this is the kind of scale we have to really think about if, if uh, we're going to avoid this, um, this rush of extinctions after the creation of protected areas. We need to think about tens of thousands of square kilometers. And that towards the end, I will get to why this is necessary. Um, not only was area important in, in accounting for the extinctions, but the time since park establishment. Uh, also, uh, when you scale the data properly, uh, you can show that, that time and area, uh, reduction in area are the, are the single greatest uh, enemies of biodiversity retention. About this same time, there were people writing articles, including Jared Diamond, on, on the, 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 the impending extinction crisis, as it's called, and what was causing it. And uh, Jared wrote a famous uh, uh, a paper entitled The Four Horsemen of the Extinction Apocalypse, in which he um, put forward the evidence related to um, these, these four types of processes as being the fundamental drivers of extinction. Habitat loss, fragmentation, overexploitation, that is direct harvest of species as we're doing with bluefin tuna all around the world right now, for example, and uh, invasive species. Um, true, each, one, each of these processes has contributed to um, extinctions in different places, different times, and you can, you can um, put, bring forward lots and lots of examples. But when you stop to think about it for a minute, these are the processes, the very processes that protected areas are designed to avoid. And so uh, if we look at what protected areas do, well, uh, they have protection. That's the very point of it, and protection is supposed to conserve the habitat, um, so to avoid habitat loss. And the contiguity of protected areas is the antithesis of fragmentation. So as I pointed out in the case of the, of the Western parks, they're not really fragmented. They're embedded in a landscape of, of, of mostly natural habitats that have some uh, some uh, uh, exploitative use, but they're not really fragments. Um, uh, enforcement deters hunting, and uh, natural habitat, not always, but very frequently, in, uh, deters the invasion of exotic species. So uh, it was hard to put these four horsemen of the extinction apocalypse together with Newmark's observations. There was something that just didn't seem to, to fit together. Well. Um, about this time, a little later, in the early 90s, um, uh, the state of conservation biology was summed up in a very important and influential uh, presidential lecture given by a famous and distinguished Australian wildlife biologist named Graham Cowley, who was uh, the president of the British Ecological Society and, and made, made this presentation as his presidential address. In his, uh, in his speech, Cowley uh, said they were, they're really conservation, um, a, a challenge of conservation could be thought of a, as, a, as in, at two levels, two paradigms that serve to describe why things go extinct. Um, one of them was what he called the small population paradigm, uh, which refers to a whole collection of biological processes and mechanisms that uh, begin to uh, take hold when a population reaches a precarious lower level of, of total uh, absolute numbers, um, so-called population, small population paradigm. Come back to that in a second. Uh, um, what I will say about the small population paradigm is that it was based on very solid and well-established science, much of it science that was already 
in the, uh, by 1990, 50 years or more old, pre-World War II science. Um, uh, this was the, came from the roots of population biology. It was something we knew a lot of. In fact, uh, Cowley himself had made his whole career rescuing Australian species from the brink of extinction uh, using the tools that came out of uh, knowledge of this small population paradigm. But uh, the bigger question is, well, what is it that's, that's forcing populations down to such tiny levels that they become vulnerable to the small population phenomenon? Um, that he, he had no answer to. He threw up his hands and says, here is the frontier of conservation biology. This is where we need to go. This is what we need to find out. And uh, so most of what I, I will say from now on uh, will have to do with trying to answer uh, Cowley's big question. Um, so it's a small population syndrome is, uh, is composed of a, a whole array of different kinds of biological mechanisms. I don't want to take too long, so I'll just uh, quickly pass over these, but there are things that cause loss of uh, genetic variation, like population fluxions, uh, uh, genetic drift, inbreeding, uh, skewed sex ratios, and so on. There's a whole lot of these things, and to, to collectively they're referred to in the conservation literature as the extinction vortex. Uh, because once the population gets down to such small numbers that these things begin to affect its reproductive success, um, then uh, they uh, act in synergistic ways uh, to create a, a downward spiral towards extinction, hence the extinction vortex. Um, uh, knowledge of these processes and mechanisms has been very important. In fact, we put it to great use in connection with the Endangered Species Act to rescue a number of, of emblematic species, North American species, from extinction. And Cowley had done similar things in Australia. This is a list of, of, of species that have, in fact, been successfully rescued from the very brink of extinction by application of our knowledge of this, uh, these small population phenomena. At least four of these, the, the Guam rail, the California condor, the black-footed parrot, and red wolf have, have been lost entirely from the wild. It, that is, all known living individuals of these species have been brought into captivity, raised in captivity, and then there have been successful reintroduction programs of the condor, the ferret, and the wolf. The Guam rail, unfortunately, has nowhere left to go, and so it is, um, I guess it's uh, permanently doomed uh, to be a, a captive species. Well, um, experience with the Endangered Species Act, um, which is essentially a reactive uh, 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 response to the extinction crisis, uh, shows, has, uh, has produced these results. That is, if you look at the number of listed species from the very first year, 1974, when the act went into effect, you see a, a perfect exponential rise in the number of species. And now there are over a thousand of them. These aren't very up-to-date data. And uh, there are several thousand more waiting to be listed. That prospect is so frightening to the Congress that the Congress won't touch this with a 10-foot pole. Um, the, the ESA, the Endangered Species Act, of which we've uh, it's been the centerpiece of our, at least at the federal level of our effort to conserve biology, has, has run into the ground. So we really need something else because the Congress isn't just going to go on approving uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of more um, endangered species, even though uh, they're out there. Um, so we need a new approach. That's clear. Um, here's data from David Wilco that shows that uh, if you look at all the mammals, birds, invertebrates, and plants that have been listed under the ESA, uh, it's only when they're in the most desperate circumstances that they ever achieve recognition by being officially on the list and then uh, and given the, 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 the protections that come with it. Birds and mammals, a thousand invertebrates, about the same plants, less than 120. Well, uh, this puts every species that gets on the ESA into that uh, a small population category. We need to get away from that because that's not doing what we want. Now, there are a few people, and David Wilco was one of them. Um, maybe he'll talk about it while he's here this week. 
um, who began to take a different course in uh, trying to understand what was going on. As I say, the Newmark data um, cast doubts that on, the, on the idea that, that fragmentation per se, that is just contraction in area or isolation from other habitat of a similar kind, uh, was causing these extinctions. It could have been correlated with it, but this difference between correlation and causality is very, uh, very crucial to understand here. So people began studying two other um, uh, issues, not realizing uh, how they were related, at least initially, to fragmentation and how the whole could be explained by a completely different set of processes. Um, um, so I'm going to talk about mesopredator release and uh, herbivore release, um, and you'll learn more about exactly what I mean. Uh, as for mesopredator relief, the key paper was one by uh, 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 Kevin Crooks and Michael Soule appeared in Nature around, uh, what was, 1999. Uh, Crooks and Soule studied a collection of 32 canyons that radiate out from San Diego in California. If, if any of you have been in San Diego, you know it's hilly and it's elevated, and the canyons cut into it um, all around the perimeter of the city, and some of those canyons uh, go right out into the desert to the east, east of the city. Well. Uh, they set up their experiment to, uh, to look at equal numbers of what they called open and closed canyons. Uh, the open canyons were ones that uh, were only partially enclosed by the city and that uh, at, their, at their exits um, went out into the open desert to the east of the city. Uh, the closed canyons were ones that were completely surrounded by city and, and did not have any, any corridors or any connection to uh, other habitat. And what they found was really, really quite startling and remarkable. Uh, they found that uh, the closed canyons, the ones that were in, uh, encircled by city, uh, had uh, bird communities that were drastically different from the expected native community of California chaparral, which was the habitat in all, of the, in all of the canyons. And the culprit they identified as people's cats. Um, where there were closed canyons, the cats would entertain themselves by day and by night by going in there and hunting small wildlife. This is what cats like to do. And these are subsidized cats. They go out and they, they eat their plate of food at home and then at night they go into the canyon and hunt hunt little animals, and uh, their cumulative impact was drastic, um, and uh, understandably so, because the density of cats was being maintained at artificially high levels by the subsidies they were getting from people. So they had huge densities, much, much greater than truly wild cats would ever have been able to attain. And the impacts on the small animal communities were, were really um, uh, striking. I, uh, it extended to lizards, frogs, small mammals, birds. Now, open canyons uh, provided access to coyotes, and the coyotes liked to eat cats. Uh, not that they'd had to eat a lot of cats, to make the point. Um, they were hunting other things, including rats and rabbits in these canyons, so the cats weren't the sole motivation that brought coyotes into the middle of the city at night to look for prey. Uh, and the cats, not being sort of astute animals themselves, quickly learned it, that the, the canyons that had coyotes were really dangerous places, and they tended to stay out of them. Uh, and so um, when you compared the bird faunas of canyons with coyotes and canyons without coyotes, they're just really remarkably different. The with coyote community includes all the California specialties that bird watchers go to California to see, things like the Rufus Crown Sparrow and the Spano Pepla and the California Quail, etc. But if you look on the right-hand side where there were house cats and no coyotes, park pigeons, starlings, English sparrows, birds you see in downtown Manhattan, and, uh, and it's, there's nothing special about them. Um, these are drastically different communities and the difference is not attributable to the area of the canyon, but to whether 
a top predator has access to the habitat. That is the crucial factor. And so this was a real breakthrough in understanding what is causing these, these rushes of extinctions to occur in small habitat patches. Um, this is again work of Wilkos, did, done while he was in graduate school. I'm gonna bring this into the Eastern context. Um, he did a, a landmark experiment consisting of putting out little artificial nests into forest uh, habitats in, in small, medium, and large patches, uh, stocking the nests with quail eggs, coming back a week later to see whether the eggs were still there. And, and uh, what he found is shown here um, in, in uh, small habitat fragments of, of 10 hectares or less, uh, the uh, fraction of nests that were discovered and raided go, went up to over 90 percent, uh, never less than about 20 percent. Um, even in large um, uh, forests of 1,000 hectares or so, um, there were still quite appreciably high uh, nest uh, rates of nest loss, and it was only in this control, Great Smoky Mountains, which is the largest contiguous patch of forested uh, land we have in the entire eastern half of North America, um, then the predation rate was low, about 2%. But up here, 80%, it's 40 times higher. Well, there's lots and lots of uh, data on, on, on this phenomenon, and uh, it's been shown conclusively that when nest predation rates get way up into this range, most of the, the bird species that normally occupy forested habitat, eastern North America, are, uh, attempt to reproduce at a loss. That is, the, the, the number of young they're able to raise is not nearly up to uh, matching the normal mortality rate. The, the adults themselves die off at a normal rate. They're not at any great risk. It's just they can't reproduce. And, and so uh, this is a very widespread problem. And, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot known about it now. Uh, I mentioned there were two of these processes. The other I called herbivore release. Um, everyone here knows there are too many deer, and really the deer are the root of another major uh, problem that's affecting not just the east, but now increasingly the west too. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, seminal paper on this was done by uh, Don Waller and William Alverson and Solheim in Wisconsin in 1998 and uh, 88 rather, and um, uh, just to give you a flavor of that, um, uh, the, uh, uh, I can show you these pictures from uh, Eastern National Parks. Now, the two on the left are from the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, where still, through some miraculous process I don't fully understand, but still the deer populations are relatively low. And if you go to, the, the Smokies, or if you had gone to any eastern woodland in April or May, this is what you ought to see. This is what an eastern forest ought to look like just before the leaves come out. The understory is an incredible flush of green. It's rich in, in flowering plant species, and not quite as rich as the wet pine savanna, but up to 20 or 25 species per square meter, including beautiful things like this crested iris. Deer completely transform that scene, completely erase it. They turn it into this, which is a monoculture of one of the very few herbaceous plants they won't eat. No matter how hungry they get, they still won't eat that, which is something called hay-scented fern. And so these absolutely magnificent displays of trilliums and other wildflowers that you can still see in the Smokies have virtually disappeared from the Shenandoah National Park where I took that picture where deer are a huge problem. Uh, so deer are transforming our, our forests across most of the eastern half of the North American continent. They are changing the tree composition, they're changing the shrub composition, and they're practically eliminating the native herbaceous flora, which constitutes about 80% of the total plant diversity of eastern deciduous forests. It's in these herbaceous plants, not the trees, it's the herbaceous plants. And, that's, and, and those are the plants that are getting hammered hardest by um, runaway deer populations. So we come now to uh, look at a 
a theory that was proposed way back in 1960 by a famous trio of ecologists, Hairston Smith and Sobotkin, and which I'm ashamed as an ecologist to say we've been arguing about for 50 years without getting to an answer. Now, there are a lot of reasons why we haven't been able to resolve this issue in 50 years, but uh, I don't have time to go into all that, but I do want to explain that there are two opposing views. One is the top-down hypothesis of Hairston Smith and Sobotkin, which is simple, straightforward. Anybody can, a child can understand it. It is that we have predators at the top of the food chain. The predators control the numbers of consumers, mostly things that eat plants, but the prey of predators. Um, and by controlling the numbers of consumers, um, the predators indirectly benefit plants by taking the pressure of herbivory off of reducing it to a tolerable level. So predators help plants by eating the things that eat plants. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the alternative hypothesis is the plant defense hypothesis, staunchly supported mostly by people who study invertebrates. Um, the plant defense hypothesis has a, has a solid financial underpinning as well, uh, because it's, it's uh, amply demonstrated that plants fill themselves up with all kinds of noxious chemicals, sometimes deadly poisonous, sometimes things that give you indigestion, sometimes things that just taste terrible. Um, but plants are very good chemists, and they're capable of producing up to 30 or 35 percent of their, of their mass in the form of defensive chemicals designed expressly to deter herbivory. And so the, the plant defense hypothesis, the bottom-up hypothesis, as I call it here, um, says that, that producers, the plants, um, make themselves unpalatable or poisonous to the consumers, and therefore um, the consumers are limited by the quality of forage, not by the predators. And so the people who, who advocate the, the plant defense side of this uh, debate um, discount the value of predators and say, oh, they only eat the old and the sick and the lame. They're not really controlling uh, the herbivore populations. Okay, so that's the debate. Are the plants are controlling the rate of herbivory or are the predators controlling? Is it bottom up or is it top down? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about my own research on this subject. It takes place in northern South America, in Venezuela, in a huge hydroelectric impoundment called Lago Guri. Uh, it's, it's an enormous place uh, from the dam up here at the north down to the, uh, the beginning of the, the flooded terrain. It's 120 kilometers across here. It's about 70 kilometers. It's almost like an inland sea. You could, if you're out here in a small boat, you can't see land. All you can see is a few mountain tops appearing above the horizon in a great distance, a very big place. Uh, the, the, the impoundment flooded a, a naturally hilly landscape so that when the water reached its final stage, um, there were hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of little islands sticking out. And these islands make a perfect fragmentation laboratory. This is one of the most extraordinary natural experiments that um, uh, could, ever, could ever be done for uh, a, a population biologist or ecologist. Well, we studied this system for 12 years. We had two groups of islands, one in the north, mostly uh, larger islands, and then a southern group in this with uh, mostly composed small islands. This is an arm of the peninsula of the mainland that served as, as one of our control sites, and, and you can see the islands of various size. They're all isolated by the same um, uh, medium, that is water, and uh, so uh, you didn't have to worry about the constitution of the matrix, it was all the same. Isolation was very good. Some of these islands are, are uh, quite isolated, um, like, uh, like the islands of our small group. Uh, these were, uh, these were uh, five or six kilometers from the nearest mainland, that was seven kilometers from the nearest mainland. So these are very isolated. Well, there's a rule in ecology, one of the few rules that's really hard and fast, and it derives ultimately from thermodynamics, so it can't be broken. And the rule is that predators need more room than their prey, because predators have to cons 
feed off a whole population of prey. So a place that will support just a few prey is, is not going to be a viable, a viable homeland for a predator. So the effect of flooding in the Caroni Valley here and creating all these islands meant that most of these little fragments were too small to sustain any, any serious predator at all. The, the, it was the experimenter's dream uh, that is producing habitat, samples of habitat that have no predators whatsoever in them. This is something, this is the main reason why this argument's gone on for 50 years, because you can't do this normally. Uh, Lago Guri did it. And uh, uh, to make a long story short, uh, one group of species that responded to the flooding um, uh, and was able to survive on these small islands subsequent to flooding were these four generalist herbivores. These are plant eaters, and they're all quite um, adept at eating a wide array of different kinds of plants, or eating fruits and, and uh, leaves and other plant parts, even the flowers. Um, they're leafcutter ants, the red howler monkeys, uh, the common iguana, and this red-footed tortoise. Now, the, the, the howler monkeys and the uh, iguanas um, are only in the canopy, so they're feeding on the leaves of, of taller trees. Uh, the tortoise is earthbound, so it eats fruits and seeds and, and small plants, and the leafcutter ants are everywhere. Um, each of these species on those small islands, as improbable as it may seem to you, attain densities 10 times or more greater than on the mainland. So there was an explosion, a population explosion, of all of these simultaneously on these tiny little, tiny little islands like that. Even the howler monkeys um, were able to persist and reproduce on tiny little islands of half a hectare, um, which to me just was incredible. Um, but the combined impact of all these herbivores at 10 times or more normal densities was to literally destroy the vegetation. So uh, this, this affirms what Hairston Smith and Slobodkin said 50 years ago, and it completely destroys the plant defense hypothesis, because when you have liberated herbivores without any top-down control from predator at all, they utterly destroy the vegetation. Um, here you can see this control site. It's leafy and green. and and full of regenerating plants. Lots of plants in there with small stems. You look in here, there's nothing with small stems. There's a few little leafy greens. Those are mostly from a bambusoid grass. It's not a tree seedling at all. And in fact, uh, there, there's a, this is tropical forest. There are a large number of tree species in this environment, and not one of them was able to recruit at rates faster than it was dying in, in, this, uh, uh, in, in this condition of hyperabundant herbivores. So every plant in the system was going down. And the, uh, the end point of that is total collapse of the forest. Um, here you see some leafcutter ant uh, recently dug entrances. Uh, here's one, one survivor boldly uh, leafing out in the midst of, uh, of, of destruction. Uh, the uh, defoliation uh, includes the canopy. It's not just on the understory. This is months after the forest normally leaves out, and you can see most of the canopy is bare. Uh, and the end, end point of, of repeated episodes of defoliation is, is the complete caps of the collapse of the forest. The trees, the vines, uh, branches fall down first, and the forest disappears. It stops being a forest. It becomes a, a, a thicket of, of uh, shrubs and vines that are uh, the least palatable things in the, in the plant community for the leafcutter ants. And so uh, this demonstrates something that's um, uh, the, the, the point that I want to end up with, which is that without predators in the system, without that top-down regulation, the whole system collapses. It may take a long time, but it eventually collapses. We've seen bird communities collapse. We've seen wildflower communities collapse. Here we see a whole forest collapse. Uh, it's all due to the same fundamental cause. Uh, there's no top-down control 
of the, of the herbivores or of the mesopredators. And so this introduces the concept of alternative states. And this is where my research is focusing right now. We've learned now that all ecosystems, all ecosystems have alternative states. We're not expecting that. This is completely new and novel uh, because we, we expect what, we've, what we're familiar with, what we know, what we've seen. Uh, but um, these alternative states are real and they uh, usually come with a drastic decrease in, in biodiversity, large numbers of extinctions. And out the other end comes a completely different kind of habitat. Now, I spend a lot of my life uh, living uh, beside a lake in Peru. This is our little, one of the buildings of our little biological station there. And uh, this, we've seen this lake assume alternative states um, in the last few years since a, a huge flood in 2003. The normal condition of the lake is, to, uh, is, is the phytoplankton state. Um, there are microscopic algae, phytoplankton, that are the base of the food chain and that support a very, uh, a very productive community that is uh, uh, rich in fish and in things that eat fish. Um, but after the flood, the plankton disappeared, the water became clear, and this huge growth of underwater vegetation, submerged aquatic vegetation, submerged macrophytes, a thing called nodges, basically filled the lake. And, um, <coughs> The fish community collapsed, and many other things happened that I don't have time to talk about. A couple of years later, the submerged aquatic community faded, and the lake covered over with floating aquatics. And that's even worse, because all the photosynthesis is in the air. It's not the water. So all the oxygen produced by the photosynthesis doesn't go in the water. The water becomes anoxic, and nothing else can live in it and all the photosynthesis that goes back into the atmosphere. So this, this is a terrible state. That lasted for two years, and now we've seen transitions and it's finally gone back to the plankton. But these, this is in a totally natural system. There's no human influence at all, and, uh, and yet uh, given a, a, a strong shove by the, the flood, the lake has convulsed through these alternative states with just drastically different um, the characteristics of the corresponding ecosystems. And so now I'm, I'm finishing up. I'm a little over. I'm sorry about that. But this makes the point that I made a moment ago, that every ecosystem in the world, when looked at, uh, shows this property of alternative states. Um, I won't go through all of these. This is the famous uh, case uh, of, the, of the sea otter and the kelp forest. I think a lot of you have heard of that. Uh, it's controlled by one, one animal, a top predator in the system, the sea otter. The sea otter eats abalone and sea urchins, and uh, those are the principal grazers in the system. So when the sea otters are present, you have this wonderful kelp forest that provides shelter for and nursery grounds for lots of other fish and other organisms. When the sea otter is gone, uh, then the uh, the sea urchins particularly explode in abundance, just as I showed you about the leafcutter ants and howler monkeys on the Gurry Island, same thing. And they eat down uh, the substrate, uh, so the kelp forest disappears, and you have what's called instead an urchin barrens, and it really is barren. So uh, I don't have time to go through all these cases, but that's just one. In the marine realm, to uh, demonstrate that this is not confined to freshwater or terrestrial situations, but it's, it's universal. Uh, this is um, with and without Arctic foxes in, uh, on an island in the Aleutians. This is with and without a predatory, a top predator fish, the pike in, in the Wisconsin lakes. Here's our Siguri stuff. This is with and without wolves. Uh, these are two cases in the Caribbean and the Central Pacific coral reefs uh, with and without um, the parrotfish and other grazing fish that graze algae off the coral. And when a reef is overfished and all the fish that provide this, this consumer service are gone, uh, then the coral becomes overgrown with algae and dies away. So you have either a coral, uh, a nice uh, coral reef, or you have this scummy algae uh, covered debris, which is not aesthetic at all. 
Uh, this is plus and minus just a little lizard, a little anolis lizard on some islands in the West Indies. Here is Serengeti with and without wildebeest. The wildebeest all died off early in the 20th century due to a, a, an epidemic of rinderpest, changed the whole ecosystem, changed the fire ecology. Um, so these are alternative states in Serengeti. And finally, this is with and without largemouth bass in uh, eastern North American streams. So these, these cases cover the Arctic, the temperate, the tropics, the freshwater, saltwater, inshore, outshore, everything. This is the way the world works. And uh, conservation needs to get this message. What we have to do to conserve biodiversity here in North America, everywhere else, is take care of things like this. It's not going to be popular. There's going to be a lot of backlash. You already know about the backlash to the, to the wolf reintroduction in Yellowstone, but Secretary Babbitt did the right thing. He put the wolves back, and it's healing a lot of the problems in Yellowstone, very clearly healing a lot of the problems. So all around the world, we need things like that and their counterparts, or nature's going to fall apart just the way I've, I've shown you. So if we want to keep it like that, um, then we've got to learn this lesson and apply it, and that's the new conservation paradigm I was started out with. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry, I don't need to talk. So it sounds like the first step is to have uh, an accurate assessment of what is the number of square kilometers that you need to have to sustain the further population that that kind of rules the system. Yeah, it's a it's a much it's a complicated issue, and I don't think there's going to be a number. Um, it will depend, among other things, not just on the biology but on the human acceptance and tolerance. Here in the United States, we're not very tolerant. We're not very tolerant at all. Any animal's causing a problem, we want to kill it. That's, what, that's our first reaction. In fact, the federal government has had a, a, a sort of predator control program. It's now 50, 60 years old. It's been going on. It's what originally killed all, all the wolves in Yellowstone. It was a federal government concerted action determined to kill every last wolf, and it succeeded. That's why we had to reintroduce them. So first of all, we need tolerance, and uh, that's been in short supply. There are other countries like India uh, where there's a lot of tolerance, and so that's the only reason there are still tigers in India, is that they have a capacity for tolerance that goes beyond anything we can even imagine. Um, but that's what saved the tiger in India. So uh, it's, it's not just the biology. You've got to get the the human side of it right, too. But to, to, to say something a little more positive than that, um, the predation regime has recently come back to my backyard in North Carolina. It's been absent for 100 years or so, I suspect. There's an animal in the eastern US, and I don't know whether you have them here in Indiana, but along the east coast, and it's getting some publicity nowadays. It's not a coyote, and it's not a wolf. It's something in between. It's the product of hybridizations between coyotes and wolves. And it's much bigger than a coyote, probably twice as heavy as a coyote. And it has the property of running in packs rather than hunting singly, which is what coyotes do. Um, and it kills deer. It goes after deer. And boy, do they make a noise when they're going after deer. But they're, they're, there's the first thing to arrive on the scene. That is, uh, that is killing deer. So maybe this will be the answer to the, uh, to the deer problem in the East, this new animal that never existed before, but it's, it's doing the job, it's playing, playing the role. So I, I'm really confident if, 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 a, if a, a highly developed landscape like Central North Carolina can, can support a, a deer killing predator, then there's, then there's good possibility that, that this whole deer problem can and the meso problem, uh, meso predator problem, along with it, um, can um, c can find a new a new balance. It's akin to those canyons in San Diego County. Um, mountain lions are making their way back into this area, but my question is, wouldn't you expect infectious diseases to play the same role that top predators if 
if the consumers become so super abundant, their populations are out of control, it's a perfect scenario for some disease epidemic to control their population rather than a top predator. Well, that's true, that's true. But if, if you look at the, the history of, of epidemics, they, they are catastrophic when they occur, but there are always some resistant individuals in a population. And the population will reconstitute itself out of, the, out of the resistant individuals and then from that point on be resistant. And so um, the, the effect of disease is only temporary, where the effect of, of predators is permanent. And, and I, I think we're looking for permanent solutions. So um, I'm, I'm curious about, uh, like I read a little bit of Mark Boyce, who's a population biologist in the Yellowstone um, ecosystem, and he's argued for ecological process management rather than management for biodiversity per se. And his argument there has been that if you want to uh, manage for a healthy grizzly population, for example, what you need for this predator, you need vast sort of lodgepole, uninterrupted, unpatched uh, lodgepole pine sort of ecosystems. And his, his argument is that um, managing at that scale reduces biodiversity um, because you can, you, can, you can increase biodiversity by creating a patchwork of habitats for songbirds and so on and so forth, but for the grizzly bear, managing properly for it means a reduction in biodiversity. So he thinks that biodiversity isn't the greatest index for making management decisions. Is your, does your research sort of suggest that that's maybe a unusual... Well, you know, in, in, in the ide ideal state, you shouldn't have to manage at all. Nature does the job perfectly well. It, it did it for millions of years before we humans got here and invented the role of, of ecosystem managers. So, uh, uh, but that's, that's, a, that's a, a not, the, not the answer you wanted to hear, I'm, I'm sure. But uh, uh, the, other is, the other is an argument about biodiversity. Uh, I showed the side-by-side -side comparison of the bird communities in the San Diego canyons. It ultimately comes down to a value judgment. One species is one you want, one species is maybe not one you want. Um, but the, the list on the left in the canyons that had coyotes were the original native inhabitants of California chaparral. And those are the species that are being impacted by these environmental changes, including the re removal of predators. And so presumably those, those should be the target of your management. If you manage, in, as you say, in huge blocks for grizzly bears, yes, in the end, it would drive out all the starlings and English sparrows and park pigeons. But are those the species you want to manage for? Probably not. So I think that's the, the, the argument, yeah, has a certain validity. But if it, it, it's not the total number of species that is, is the, it should be the target of, of management. It's getting back nature to where uh, to where it can sustain itself. That should be the goal. Safe, just one more question. Yes, sir, uh, so uh, at the beginning of your talk, you discussed the, the, the ESA and, uh, and how uh, it, it's been uh, something of a piecemeal tool and, and not a particularly uh, useful tool. And it only helps when, uh, when you're down, basically, to, the, to the, these numbers where it doesn't really matter anymore for those particular species. Uh, but, in terms of uh, U.S. law, we will never get another law like ESA or any other of these, these major environmental laws on the books ever again. So working within the ESA is, is possibly one of our only, uh, uh, one of the only uh, options we really have at this point. Is there a way to use the ESA? Do you think that we can use that? It, it maybe, uh, I don't know, to decrease the threshold, start focusing on things like Panther uh, or, or mountain lion? Well, I, I guess I would put it in a slightly different way. I would say the ESA has become irrelevant because the Congress isn't willing to list any more species. Uh, the, it may protect species that are already listed, and there are over a thousand of those. Uh, but from the point of view of Congress that's worried about the expense, um, that's plenty enough. They don't want any more. Um, and in fact, if I put a list on the board of species that, in fact, ESA has successfully rescued. But each one of those costs millions and millions and millions of dollars and years of effort and lots of expert personnel working on the, on the projects. 
And that's what scares Congress. Each one of these things can cost millions of dollars. So I don't, I don't see much future for the ESA. I mean, what's done is done, and that will continue to stand. But as, as an instrument to apply to the future, um, I really have my great doubts that the ESA is, is uh, the answer we're looking for. I think uh, going back, tolerance, we need our predators and we need a public that's educated about the value of predators so the tolerance level will go up. Um, uh, this is our big challenge right now. It's, it's the, the, the lack of willingness of the public to accept that, that predators have an important role to play in regulating ecosystems. Now, it's, uh, it's really lamentable that we were so thorough and efficient at eliminating mountain lions, grizzly bears, wolves, and lots of other things out, uh, especially in the West, where the predator control agency operated with huge uh, vigor and effectiveness for decades and decades. And uh, so the ranchers out there are used to not having predators at all. So when they start to come back, they, they, they fly into an absolutely f a f a frenzy of, of hysteria and panic. Um, now, in Canada, they never had such a program. And wolf, Canada's always had wolves. Do Canadians worry about wolves? No, they don't worry about wolves. They just, they've been living with them ever since they settled the country. Um, it's not an issue in Canada. It's an issue here where we first eliminated them and now they're coming back again. And it's a really big issue. So we've, we've got a period of adjustment to make. As, as you said, the mountain lions are coming back. The gray wolves are coming back in the West. We've got red wolves in North Carolina. The predators are going to come back. They'll do the job as long as there isn't another systematic government-financed program to eradicate them, to spread poison all over the landscape, which is what they did out west, to kill everything, weasels and, and even uh, non-predators. Non they kill everything. So poisoning is very indiscriminate. So uh, we need to plead for tolerance, and the animals will do the rest. Please join me again in thanking John Turbor. Thank you all.